Good afternoon, my name is Jake, and over the next couple of minutes I'll be going over an overview of private placement offerings and the components of a private placement offering, including um, private placement memorandums, term sheets, and due diligence. So first I wanted to talk about the decision for companies to either stay private or go public. Um, it's become a pretty hot topic in recent financial markets. There's a growing number of companies that have decided that they're going to stay private rather than go public and a lot of these companies actually render values in the billions of dollars. And some of these include Uber, Snapchat, and Airbnb. So it kind of raises the question as to whether it's just a matter of poor equity market offerings or whether or not these firms want to maintain control in the long term. So in the decision uh, to go private or stay public, um, we must you know, first define what private placement really is. So private placement refers to a company that makes an offering of securities to an individual investor or an exclusive group of investors. And the main difference between a private offering and a public offering is that private offerings do not have to be regulated by the SEC and don't have to follow those uh, rules and guidelines. Um, so staying private also allows managers to retain the decision-making control in the company and they don't have to give that up to a board of directors who's appointed. Uh, the downside in private placement financing uh, is that it's extremely costly and there's a limited pool of investors that you can uh, market to. So this kind of means less liquidity and less demand which really drives up prices in the private placement market. <coughs> private placement also reduces pressure from the market to perform or make certain decisions that would otherwise be influenced by investors uh, on a board of directors. Next, I kind of want to transition into the rules and regulations that are associated with uh, private placement offerings. So although they're not subject to SEC guidelines, the Securities Act of 1933 outlined rules for private placement offerings. Most of these regulations are set forth under uh, a rule called Regulation D. Uh, so there's uh, just a few basic provisions of Regulation D. Essentially, it requires that <coughs> an offering company makes extensive disclosures regarding the nature and risks of an, of an investment and also discloses information about the company um, to, to investors. <coughs> For this, uh, companies must conduct a level of due diligence and have to provide investors <coughs> with the information that they need to uh, go through this process. Regulation D also limits the amount and type of investors that you can approach. Um, there are certain guidelines regarding uh, the amount of the offering and who you can market this type of offering to based on the dollar value of such offering. Um, it requires that also Form D be filed with the SEC, so even though it's not a uh, formal SEC filing, <coughs> there's still a form that needs to be filled out in any private placement offering that lets the SEC know that you have one. That brings us next to the process of due diligence. <coughs> due diligence is arguably probably the most important <coughs> part of the the private placement process and the goal is to provide full disclosure to the purchasing party on all aspects of the business. Uh, proper due diligence also serves to indemnify the offering company from any fraud lawsuits later on down the road basically saying that they've provided them with all the information that they have necessary. Due diligence is often connect, uh, conducted by the purchasing firm as well as any third party broker dealer that has an active participation in the uh, private placement offering. There's no definitive set of requirements for due diligence, so oftentimes it'll vary from firm to firm. But oftentimes a company will use a checklist to go through each item for due diligence. Uh, this kind of creates some problems as well, though, because when companies follow a defined checklist, it can often leave uh, some items overlooked that otherwise might not be included or thought of on a given checklist. And for this reason, due diligence should vary on a case-by-case -case basis and should uh, be restricted to the specific offering and not just a basic checklist. <coughs> so the basic checklist will include a review of several documents. Most of these will include financial statements, balance sheets, cash flow statements, corporate bylaws, lists of shareholders, any contractual obligations or tax filings, legal documents including patents, trademarks, copyrights, any insurance policies, but it should also include uh, interviews with employees and upper management to kind of get a feel for the basic uh, operations of the business as well as 
kind of the morale of the business in general. And it should include a basic analysis of job functions and procedures, just as if you were acquiring a business. <coughs> it should be the same for investors. Again, this is just very basic information and it will vary on a case-by-case -case basis. That brings us to the private placement memorandum. <coughs> the purpose of a private placement memorandum is to offer an agreement between both parties on the terms of an investment, or a private investment rather. The goal again here is for full disclosure. You want investors to know everything that they're entering into in an, in an agreement. So although private placements are not always required by law, <coughs> they serve a dual purpose, both to disclose all the information that investors need, as well as serve as a marketing tool to investors to really show them that you've done your homework and that you're committed to reaching a good deal with them. The structure of a private placement memorandum, uh, it outlines basic risk factors that are associated with the type of security that's being issued, whether it's a debt security or an equity security. It also offers a brief description of the operations of the company that's issuing uh, the security. It puts forward a general business plan, although this <coughs> is not the main component. It gives investors a basic idea of the business that they're entering. Um, it also includes a summary of terms known as the term sheet and a subscription agreement which represents the signed contract that the parties enter into. The most important part of the private placement memorandum is is most likely the term sheet. It's, the mo uh, it's essentially an agreement between both parties on the specific terms of the securities being issued. And both buyers and sellers need to know the terms of the issue, that way they later on down the road there's no questions that are asked. Um, <coughs> investors need to be really careful about what to include or exclude, and as well as the issuing company on what to include or exclude in the term sheet. Uh, terms that are overly drawn out can scare investors away, while uh, terms that are very loosely put together or have uncertainty can lead to costly problems down the road for the firm. <clears throat> the typical structure of the term sheet includes items not limited to, but including the amount of the investment, the type of security being issued, the pre-financing and post-financing value of the firm, rights and restrictions associated with the securities being issued, any financial or legal obligations, um, <coughs> agreements related to the structure and timing, timing of financing, and the purpose of the funds being raised. So overall, the private placement part market, as I said, has grown relative, relatively rapidly, and a good private placement memorandum and term sheet can either make or break you in the long run. And then, like I said, it's important for companies to pay very close attention to these items in an offering to ensure that they don't run into any financial problems down the road or don't create problems that otherwise wouldn't have arisen had they had drafted a better contract. <clears throat>